Hello and welcome along to another episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. Each week we interview a former or current professional involved in the game and talk to them about their love for the sport, how they got involved in it from start to finish and go through their career in detail, talking about all the highs and lows and the journey along the way. This week we were lucky enough to speak to another former pro, that man's Gregor Robertson. Gregor's got a number of unique features about his career. He started with highlights as a Scotland under-21 international, playing against some incredible players, which we talk about in the episode. We also then talk about his professional career after starting in the Hearts Youth Academy down in England as he moved to Nottingham Forest, before having further professional appearances at Rotherham, Chesterfield, Crewe, Northampton Town and Grimsby. We talk about all the teams he's been involved in and the managers he's played under, as well as some extremely varied experiences at Wembley over his career, including one right at the very end. Gregor retired at the age of 32 and has now moved into the written media side of the game. He talks to us about how he got involved in that and how he got his opportunity, as he also presents a podcast as well as being a weekly columnist for The Times. And I think it's fair to say he gave us a fascinating insight into both his current role and his past career in the game. And we certainly hope you enjoy listening to it as much as we did taking part. If you do enjoy the episode, please put a thumbs up on the video. Let us know down in the comments what you think of Gregor's journey. And subscribe to the channel for weekly interviews from this series. As well as match day vlogs once we're able to go to football again. And topical podcasts as well. But this is Gregor Robertson's football story. And we really hope you enjoy it. Okay, I'm delighted to be joined by Gregor now, and we have to start, as we always do with every person, we take them back to their earliest memory. So whether it be watching on TV, whether it be playing in the back garden, whatever it is, what's the first thing you remember about football? First thing I remember is playing in the back garden with either my mum or my dad. Although my dad always has a story about rolling a little toy apple towards me and uh, seeing me swing my left foot at it, and he says that, Oh, he'll never starve. That was his words, he says. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's true or not, but that's that's what he tells me. Brilliant. And then talk about watching on TV. What's the first thing you remember about watching the game? Was it a particular game or did you go to a stadium first? Uh, two things. I went to Celtic Rangers, uh, what was then called Skull Cup Final. Yeah. Uh, in the League Cup Final. And the standard memory is Terry Harlock running around kicking everyone. <laughs> uh, Rangers. <laughs> And on TV, I would say Scotland losing to Brazil in Italia 90. So I would have been, I would have been six. And that kind of sent us, sent us crashing out when I heard Nesson Dorma sing, uh, playing afterwards and I was devastated. I love so. that. Everyone, we always talk about club football now and obviously it will be the main part of this discussion as well. But almost every pro's first game they remember is a major international tournament. Almost every single one. Yeah, it's the first thing that kind of grips, I think probably grips you, because it grips everyone around you, whether they're big football fans or not. So, yeah, uh, so yeah I remember that. I remember falling my eyes out afterwards. <laughs> Talk to me about moving on to competitive football at youth level. Obviously, we'll get towards getting into the Hearts youth system and moving south of the border. But what's the first competitive team you played for? Was it a local, a Sunday? So I played for my school team. I was actually a goalkeeper. And then <laughs> I moved to school and the manager's son, who's still a very good friend of mine, was the goalkeeper for the school team. So I thought, I've got no chance of getting a game here. <laughs> uh, so I went outfield. So that was the first competitive football. And then I played for a team called Hutchison Vale, which is a kind of very prominent team in Edinburgh. And then I moved on to Celtic Boys Club. So that was a kind of early competitive football. That was up to about the age of 12. Okay, and talk to me about how you got from playing at that level locally to then being spotted by Hearts and a professional academy in the SPL. As I say, I was at Celtic for maybe three three or four years. Yeah. And there was a period where the, the age groups changed in when I was a kid. And it, everybody used to be, the, if you're born after August or before August, that determined where you played. And it changed to January. So <laughs> there was a lot of upheaval around that time. And I moved to Hibs for a year, then Hearts. And then it was actually a a former teammate at Celtic, his dad was doing some scouting for Nottingham Forest. They invited me down for a trial around Christmas time and they asked me to sign and they said, you want to leave school and come now or do you want to wait until the summer? And I said, I'll, I'll come now, please. <laughs> <laughs> not, that I, not that I didn't enjoy school, it was just that I saw it as an opportunity I wanted to take the most of, you know. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things that interests me most about yours. Of the guests we've had on, you're probably one of the earliest to move away from home and south of the border. 
So how much of an influence was the personal life in that or was it just purely football driven at that point? That was just a purely football based decision. I, I, like I say, I, was, you know, I enjoyed school and I did, I did reasonably well at school, but I'd missed the first half year of what was normally a three year apprenticeship for, okay. for, for youth team players at that time. Uh, so I was already playing catch up, I saw it, that's the way I saw it. Yeah. So if I wait another year, then it was, uh, sorry, half a year, it was half a year I had to impress. So yeah. I'm glad I did that. So it was just a football-based decision. You know, I was sad to leave, say goodbye to my mum and my friends and, and, and schoolmates and stuff, but I was plunged into a kind of giant hostel with 20-odd 20, 20 uh, YTs <laughs> just around the corner from the city ground. So there was no time to kind of <laughs> to cry about it. <laughs> Absolutely. I guess I, I want to ask about that because a, a few players have mentioned early on in their career making their decisions and their parents being very influential in it. So was there any element where your parents tried to tempt you to stay at home for a bit longer? Because obviously they don't want their son to be going at 14, 15, even if they understand the reasons. Um, my mum, she just really said that whatever you want to do, do. And I think she would have deep down wanted me to stay <laughs> to, finish, to finish off that. Yeah. That half a year at school, finished my exams and stuff. It's slightly different in Scotland. They'd already done some exams the year before, but so I had some qualifications. And also, Forrest were very good in laying out what they were going to do in terms of education for you yeah. in your apprenticeship. So, so they invited her down, and and we spent a few days, and they kind of sold it to us, and she was fine with fine with that afterwards. Fantastic. And then talk to me about being at Nottingham Forest because obviously it was. Even at that time, they'd just come out of the Premier League. They were a massive club. They're, they had quite a lot of uh, a well-famed youth academy and a number of great players that came through it. So what was that experience like being there? Was there a big difference in the professionalism of the setup? Yeah, I mean, I think, although I hadn't, I hadn't gone full-time in Scottish football, the, the facilities, yeah. the scale. And I just remember, actually, the first time I arrived in Nottingham and I was travelling over Trent Bridge and saw the... The, the stadium perched yeah. on the bank there and and there's a kind of the, the signage about European Cups and yeah. Ryan Clough and Walls and I thought this is a big this is a big club and and the, as you say the academy I had when you watch the first team game there was already players like Andy Reid in the first team, David Pruton, Jermaine Genus was soon to be getting into that team. You know, I was in a team with Michael Dawson. Yeah. So there was a lot of good players and Paul Hart had a very good reputation. He came from Leeds United and played a big part in a lot of the Leeds players who got came through at that era. So it was a good, I knew it was a good place to be. Uh, it was just about making the most of the opportunity. And I guess you did pretty quickly, because it, it was at a fairly young age that you ended up breaking into the Nottingham Forest team. So talk to me about how that came about. Was, was it as simple as flying through the reserves and the youth team in good form? Or... Did you still have that little bit of fear about you? Because some pros just throw themselves at it, whereas some are a little bit scared to upset people in the dressing room and just do whatever they're told and don't speak unless they're spoken to. I'd say I was somewhere in, in the middle of those two extremes. Okay. You know, I certainly wasn't a shrinking violet, but I wasn't kind of... I played with some players, young, some young players who were kind of ballsy enough to go in and say what they thought to, <laughs> to the first-team player. That wasn't quite like that, certainly not early on. I think... You know, it, it certainly wasn't plain sailing. I, I was on the bench once in, in the first two and a half years of that, you know, that was my first contract, two and a half years. I was only on the bench once and then I only got another one year contract. So it was another chance. It wasn't kind of, they weren't putting a great deal of faith in me, you know. <laughs> that was the truth. Then players left, a guy called Jim Brennan, who was the left back at the time. And he moved on in the summer. Forrest had just got to the playoffs. He moved on to Norwich. So that, that was kind of, that, that, that was an opportunity for me. There was only one other left back then. And he, he was quite injury prone. So <laughs> I got into the team, I got into the team quite early. I played in the Carling Cup against Tranmere Rovers. That was my debut. But so yeah, that was like the end of one journey and the beginning of a new one. So I want to ask about that debut. This is probably one of the questions that has the biggest variety of answers. Is that initial emotion when you found out you were going to be involved in the squad and then when you found out you were going to be playing, what was that What was that moment like? Was it fear? Was it excitement? A complete mix of every emotion under the sun? There's been such a variation in the answers to this. There's definitely some fear. Yeah. But it was, it was more, more excitement. I mean, 
I remember Paul Hart pulled me in and said, you're, you're playing tonight. And he was a big kind of quite imposing figure, yeah. Pierce and Stare. He saw me kind of smile. In fact, I wrote a piece about this quite recently. He saw me kind of <laughs> smile and then he broke out in a smile and it was like, you rarely got a smile from, <laughs> from Paul Hart. So he knew, he knew that it was a big, a kind of big moment for me. So, yeah, it was, but then, you know, the butterflies when your stomach, that's the old cliche, but it's true. Right up until the moment I ran out of the tunnel. Yeah. And then it was just, I've waited for this for a long time. This is what I've worked hard for and it was excitement and, and I relished every moment apart from getting cramp in extra time. <laughs> First time I'd ever got cramp in my life. Uh, it wasn't an ideal way to start, was it? <laughs> no, no. But I played well and it was a good game and uh, I, yeah, fond memories of that. And talk to me about that debut. Did you feel you were ready for it when you got picked? Because we've got, again, a bit of a variety where some people felt they deserved the chance earlier. Some felt they weren't ready to be playing at all. Did you feel like it was the right time or did you feel like you should have been in the team prior to that? Well, like I say, the season before they were in the playoffs and, uh, you know, really competing at the top of the championship. And the game I was on the bench, it was in the Carling Cup against, I think it was against Walsall and they were 2-0 down within half an hour or something. So that kind of kiboshed any prospect I think they would have given me a yeah. debut in that game and so then but by the time the, the next season came around I felt like I was definitely ready I'd kind of matured a bit more and a few players had moved on uh, I'd had a whole pre-season working with the first team I didn't feel out of place yeah. and so I definitely felt I was ready. Good and then I guess the championship debut or division one as it was still then it was probably the most important one because you made your league debut in the derby is that correct? Yeah, so that was, I think that was like four days later. And I, I remember actually Ian Boyer, who was the assistant manager for us on the European Cup. He's a bit of a legend. Yeah. He, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't start in that game. And he pulled me aside and said, explained why. So, you know, I'd done, I'd done pretty well in the Tramier game and there was a possibility that I would start. And he said, this is, you know, this is a pretty big occasion. And he was right. When I came on, there was 10 minutes to go. We just had a, a man sent off. And uh, 30,000 fans. That was different to Tranmere at Prenton yeah. Park, you know. <laughs> this is a this is a kind of a real uh, a real game in a in a big atmosphere. So they probably made the right decision. But it was only another only had to wait another seven days for my first start. I think it was against Preston. And talk to me uh, about that game. Do you remember much of it? Your first start, because obviously we it's quite interesting as a football fan. We immediately think the debut is going to be the the biggest thing. But a lot of players actually talk about their first start more fondly than their first appearance. Is that the same for you, or was nothing going to top the derby game really? Uh, just different feelings. I mean, the the, the first game of, of any is the biggest one, so that was Tranmere, and then the derby. As I say, it was like a whole new world. It was like this is a game that really matters for everyone. You know, league points, supporters kind of being being for blood in the stands. But it was a kind of 10 minutes holding on for dear life. That's yeah. what that was. Really. The Preston game, I think I played, you know, I played 90 minutes and I played well. And I thought, you know, again, it's like another step up. And I thought, again, I'm not out of place at this level. And yeah. so that was a kind of more momentous step. But uh, each one of them, you just, you have those three games. I mean, three of them came within, I think, 10 days or something. So those three games all were all kind of steps up the ladder. And then you became a, a pretty regular appearer in the Nottingham Forest team after that. So that next sort of year, I mean, we'll get on to the fact that then the first managerial change came along, which probably didn't help your chances at Nottingham Forest. But talk to me about that year in the team, because becoming a regular for a massive club that early on must be quite a special thing and certainly not an easy thing to do. It was kind of, it was a difficult time for the club. That was the one thing you, you have to say. It was, yeah. as I say, some players had moved on and... Paul Hart was kind of under under a bit of pressure, but he still he still played me and a few other. I think you know a lot of the time there was either there was myself, Wes Morgan, Michael Dawson, three nineteen year olds in the back four. Yeah. Sometimes Des Walker would, would replace them and double the average age value. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but you know, there's there's there a lot of young players in that team. Andy Reid was in front of me. He's only a couple of years older than me. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of players I knew, and I didn't feel uncomfortable and. And there's a lot of games I, I remember, I very fond memories of, you know, going up to places like Sunderland, you know, the Stadium of Light, when it was a happy place. There was yeah. Mick McCarthy and they were, you know, they were fighting for promotion. Sheffield United at Bramall Lane, you know, some big, big proper championship fixtures. And uh, 
yeah, I, I relished it. And then obviously, as you say, there was there was going to be a man, there was a managerial change on the way, and there was a lot of upheaval for the next two years, really. So, <laughs> well, you know, peaks and troughs. Well, that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about because there's a lot of obviously Forrest went for a spell of quite a few managers there, even in a couple of years for you. How was that sort of? How was that time of learning different tactical styles, different instructions, different formations, positions, probably quicker than you can learn the first one. You're then on to the next manager and learning another. Yeah, I mean, I'd say even the the thing is with with Paul Hart, we knew it all because he was the academy director when I signed. So it was the same. He always played a diamond. And if you're a left back like me, you're a full back. As soon as the goalkeeper got the ball, you split high and wide and he'd try and ping it out here. He chest the ball and he probably had a second before the winger was on top of you. But you, you were used to that. That was the way he played. After that, it was just, you know, we had Joe Kinnear, yeah. who I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to be unkind about it, but I wouldn't say there wasn't, there wasn't really a great tactical blueprint. It was just, he tried to sign, sign some good players. Uh, sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had a different way of motivating you. And then Gary Megson, there was he was a different way of motivating you again, uh, and a very different tactical blueprint. He said, I remember the first thing he said to me really was, you know, what's your biggest strength? And I, I said, I thought good passer of the ball, good left foot. And he said, well, I think it's your running. So that that kind of gave me a, an idea and everyone around us of what he valued most, and that was just hard work. Yeah. So yeah, things changed a lot under those different managers. And I mean, it's it's quite interesting to tell because, I mean, the first two of those have both worked at Luton, the club I support, and even their blueprints at the time at Luton was exactly the same as that. So it's interesting to see that that's still the case at other clubs. Um, but obviously with Gary Megson in charge, the, that then led to you unfortunately being released from Forest a little bit later. And it came with your first move to Rotherham and another man that is dear to my heart as a Luton fan, Mick Harford. Talk to me well, about Mick, how that move came about. <laughs> well, Mick, Mick had been... He'd, he'd come as assistant to Joe Kinnear. Yeah. So, and then he was he was given the job on a caretaker basis around the Christmas period. Yeah. And we had some good results and a few that were really unlucky and and quite a lot of the guy the lads wanted him to get the job. He was he was very well respected. He was a good coach, and he actually offered me a three year deal. And then was sacked like two days. Well, moved on from Exon a couple of days yeah. later. So that was unfortunate time. So yeah, I had a few options. I had quite a lot of options in in League One and one few kind of sniffs in the championship but there's something when you're young about the familiarity of a yeah. coach and Rotherham had just been relegated with us so I thought there's a good chance to be looking to bounce back up so I took the plunge with them but there was some trouble to, trouble ahead at Rotherham too. Well let's move on to that pretty quickly because unfortunately for Mickey didn't last a great deal of time and there was a little bit more upheaval at Rotherham so talk to me about being in a dressing room in that sort of spell because again there have been a a lot of players that have highlighted just how important confidence is. I know it's talked about a lot in the media, but behind the scenes, it probably seems even more important. So how do you maintain that when there's managers, coaches, scouts, physios going in and out at 100 miles an hour every two, three months? You don't. That's the thing. That's why it's such a kind of upheaval. I think we went on a 16-game run without winning. Yeah. We started really well. We were kind of fourth, I think, in the table after six, t- eight, ten games, something like that. And then, you know, we signed some good players. We signed Dion Burton up front, who was, I think he was sold to Sheffield Wednesday within six months or something. We Williamson, who went on to yeah. to Watford. We had Will Hoskins emerging, who also went on to Watford. Yeah. We had a really good team. like And we were experienced pros like Scott Minto, who was kind of winding down. Paul Hurst, who's the manager now, who yeah. was a very solid pro. So we had a good team, but... I don't know. I really, it's hard to know what. It's hard to put your finger on sometimes and what happens. And I think we got into a rut and we couldn't. We couldn't buy a win. Um, and he got the sack. And then just the change of change of face in the dugout. Alan Nil was was his kind of number two. He stepped up and uh, Nil was very easy going and kind of everybody knew him very well because he'd yeah. been there even before Mick had come. He'd been there as youth team coach. He just lightened the lightened the load a bit and he and he managed to keep us up although it was nail biting stuff. It was the final final day of the season. We played MK Dons at home and we needed a point and they needed to win, yeah. both of us, to stay up. And we drew nil nil. So the last ten minutes were kind of chaos, just heading and kicking everything out of the box and but we stayed up and 
there's still more trouble ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love that, that talk about the last games of the season. I know you've got a few nail-biting moments, which we'll get on to, but that one in particular, on the last day when you're fighting for promotional relegation, how do you know what to believe? Because obviously when people got to take a throw in, there's fans telling you that the other team are 3-0 up, 3-0 down, whatever. How do you know what to believe and how do you adapt your game to that? Well, we were actually, we were okay. I think no matter what, if we, if we drew, we were safe. I might be wrong about that. There could have been something <laughs> that happened at another game. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we went into the game knowing, because we were ahead, certainly. Of, I think we had a point or two, or maybe a point and better goal difference. Yeah. Uh, so we knew a draw was okay. But, yeah, I mean, afterwards, it's like promotion. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's a pitch invasion. I remember, I remember the, there'd been lots of upheaval in the boardroom, too, and ownership, and guys came in and gave us a little brown envelope, the new guys, which yeah. we kind of thought, you know, I thought a bonus, and he thought this isn't a good signal for for the future going no. forward. In the next season. That turned out to be to be the case, actually. So, yeah, that was that was nail biting stuff, and it was quite a kind of quite a leap from the from you know a season before playing in in the championship, and all of a sudden you're struggling to to stay in League League One. You've mentioned something that's led me on perfectly to my next question, which is about boardrooms when you're a footballer. Obviously, that was probably one of the key spells where there was a little bit of upheaval behind the scenes at a club you were at. Is that something as a as a team or a dressing room that is talked about much? Because obviously, there's this this classic cliche answer to the media is we just focus on what happens on the pitch. But is that really the case? No, I mean you you, <laughs> you hear all about what's going on. You hear rumours. You hear people read the papers. You know, everybody knows. And the main thing is, you want to know that you're going to get your next paycheck. To be brutally honest, yeah. To know whether it's a club that's worth being at longer term, because everyone, you know, at that level, you need you need to get your next paycheck. Really, absolutely. it's not like millions of pounds a year. So, uh, absolutely, we talked, we discussed it, and you know, at that stage, the, the the PFA came in when the club was 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 close to going into, into administration, um, and they asked us to to fair wages, and I think the PFA even made up made up the shortfall for us, so we didn't go without. So yeah, no, it definitely affects you. But football is almost the kind of the release from all of that. That was sort of my my next question: is does it then affect what happens on the pitch, or is it sort of that relief? Does it still boil over into the dressing room on a match day, for example? Are you talking about it an hour before kickoff, before you're going out to warm up? No, I mean not unless it's a kind of a dark joke. It's not <laughs> you know, everything is fairly light light hearted, and it's not very often you'll get someone kind of pouring their heart out before a game it's it's you know you're focused on doing the job I, I have to say I've never not been paid so I think there may be instances where that would affect players and their preparation and you know their mental state on a match day so we were we came close to that but I was never not paid we were always paid that's good news to it let's move <laughs> on to the to the next stage of your career, which you talked about something longer term and Chesterfield became the longest term point of your career and probably one of the most continuously successful spells later on as well. But unfortunately, it's the first time we have to talk about injury soon as well. But how did the move to Chesterfield come about? And again, were there other options? And if so, what was then the driving force behind the decision? So when I left, I left uh, Rotherham, I'd missed the last three months of the season, maybe with an ankle injury. And again, Alan Nil moved on. Mark Robbins came in as manager, stepped up from the youth team. And he said, I basically had to prove my fitness. And then Alan Nil moved. It's all kind of who you know at that level a lot, lot of the time. Yeah. Alan Nil moved on to Chesterfield as assistant manager. They offered me a two-year deal. I had a few other other options. But again, I, I was living in Nottingham. It was very close. A good friend of mine, Jack Lester, yeah. was going to sign in the same summer. Another good friend of mine, Barry Roach from yep. Forest, was in goals. So there's just sometimes these little factors just push you towards making a decision over another. And I'm glad I did. It was a, a good club and great, great bunch of lads that even those first two years we had really kind of close knit yeah. young group of players who we should have done better. We, we should have reached the playoffs at least, and we always just fell short. Those first two years, I, I really enjoyed, even though we weren't successful. But after that, when John Sheridan came, you know, things changed. We had the new stadium on the horizon and and uh, we had a lot of success. Because after those first two years, where obviously you were pretty much an ever-present in the team, you were flying along. 
And then unfortunately for you came the first probably major injury of your career. And it was at the most inopportune time as well, wasn't it? <laughs> well, certainly, you know, age wise, I think it was 24 or something like that. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was playing well. Yeah. I think I felt like, in a, you know, I'd played on and off for a long time and, and I was feeling I I'd played a couple of seasons almost every, every game. And I was starting to hit, hit the peak of my, my kind of career. And then it was an innocuous tackle in a, Johnson's paint trophy game <laughs> and I suffered a double leg, leg break so I was out for a year and that was first experience of the kind of solitude and uh, difficulty of of uh, returning from a major injury like that. Yeah I really want to drill into injuries because it's something we've talked about with so many guests and obviously over the last decade or so the focus on mental health has become so much more prominent and a lot of the players highlight the way that at the time they probably didn't really open up, but they were struggling when they had a first big injury. Is that something that, looking back, that you struggled with probably more than you thought? Or did you find a way to relieve that stress of not having that dressing room atmosphere, the jokes with the lads? Because you're normally quite isolated when you're injured. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, don't get me wrong, it's a difficult time. It's kind of, it's the, it's the ups and downs and, and you... You know, you, you 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 sometimes take a giant leap forward in your progress, and then other times you feel like playing football professionally again is the most alien, impossible concept <laughs> in the world. Yeah, and it's you know, I had a metal pin and screws in my legs, kind of holding it together, and sometimes you would be asked to do things that felt absolutely impossible. Uh, I remember after, I think it was the first time I went to see the surgeon after the after the surgery, yeah. and he asked me to do a single leg squat on my broken leg. And I was, I thought he was joking. And <laughs> he said, no, your leg is stronger now because of the metal than it was before. So yeah. that was always the go-to answer. It's stronger now than, than before. So sometimes getting your head around doing things was very hard. Yeah. And other times, as I say, you felt like no matter what you did, you weren't going to get back to full yeah. fitness. But I think you can learn quite a lot about yourself in those, in those moments. Yeah, it takes a lot of, a lot of kind of dedication and, mental fortitude to to make it back to to the pitch and even i mean at grassroots level between the three of us we've all had injuries on the podcast and one of the the lads couldn't face going to watch the games while he was injured whereas for me i couldn't bear to be away from it what what sort of mentality were you in that sense were you involved on the days were you going to the games were you still trying to get in and amongst the dressing room or i know some clubs then don't allow you to do that which which side of the fence were you on there you always wanted to be there on certainly on a home match day just to kind of show your support. You'd always go into the dressing room beforehand, just wish everyone all the best. Yeah. You want to kind of you want to have your face still in the picture. Yeah. Because you're forgotten about as it is, you know. You want to you want to be around the, the place and at least feel that you're doing something to support the club and the team. So yeah, sometimes it was frustrating watching. But I think that's you just as I say, you want to feel like there is some value to you actually still being a part of that football club. Absolutely. And then I guess we can move on to slightly more happy memories now, which is your return from injury and featuring in a title winning campaign the next year as Chesterfield started to rise through the league. And then obviously there's a big moment to come at Wembley as well. Um, how was that season for you? And what was it like behind the scenes? Because when momentum gets into a dressing room, some of the stories we've had about that have been incredible. So just how tight was it then? I think we knew... We went to the new stadium and it was just a huge lift. Yeah. You mean, if you've ever been to Saltergate? Oh, I had, yeah, the year before. <laughs> we film, filmed for uh, the Dam United. It was, you know, it was the oldest, one of the oldest stadiums still standing. Yeah. And on a cold Tuesday night there, it was tough sometimes. And even for the supporters sitting on wooden seats. Yeah. So to move into a shiny new kind of 10,000 seater stadium, immediately sort of, there was a huge up, uplift in, in expectation and belief and we signed some great players we signed Craig Davis yeah. up front who you know hammered in the goals so him and Jack Lester up front that was a that wasn't a league two pairing no. Mark Allett centre midfielder who yeah. was he was brilliantly consistent midfielder at that level so yeah and John Sheridan's a kind of manager who like he's just he's, he's got a little bit of arrogance about him and when he signed the players to back that up it kind of permeated throughout the rest of the squad so yeah, we were the best team by a country mile in that, that division. We scored so many goals. Dean Morgan was another one, winger. He used to play for Red End and Luton. He had a brilliant season. 
And it was only we had a little wobble at the end. Yes. We kind of, I think we lost the Bury at home. That was the first time that we kind of, there was a chance we weren't going to win the league. Yeah. We were, we were, promotion was sealed. But I, th- I remember losing that game and, we, and everybody thought afterwards, come on, we're not going to, we're not going to have had this season and then throw it, you know, throw away the league title. The league title should be ours. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think we, we hammered it home after that. And, uh, and yeah, winning, winning the league two, league two title, winning any league is a, a great achievement. So it was a, that was a very, very happy memory. Absolutely. And then I guess, unfortunately, I think we need to probably talk about injuries again at that point because <laughs> we're going back to League One and you're not able to start the campaign due to a long-term injury. How frustrating was that, watching someone come in, potentially step up at the next level when you're ready to earn that chance before an injury? The thing was, it was kind of double whammy in that I came back from the, the broken leg in November time yeah. and it was like, I think the third or fourth last, last game of the season. When I, I, I ruptured my Achilles, and it was in the same leg. It was my leg was probably a little bit weak still from yeah. from the broken leg, um, and so you know, yeah, you had a year out. You did enjoy this really kind of amazing season, winning the league, and then you were looking looking forward to another nine months out. As you say, just going back into League One, where I wasn't, I didn't have any doubts about stepping up to that level. Yeah. It was just the kind of feeling that. I had this kind of dark tunnel ahead of me again that you had <laughs> Having had the first injury, I know it being a different one, but did that make the second one easier or harder? And again, there have been different answers to this. How did you then find the second spell? I think initially it was harder in that you, you just couldn't believe it, really. You know, it's pretty bad luck. I mean, I played with one or two guys who ruptured their ACL and then came back and did it again, and you just think... You know how how mentally tough that must be, and yeah. this being a different injury was pos- was possibly a good thing. But you know it was a different set of circumstances, different kind of rehab. But it was still tough, uh, still very tough, because you you know you spent three months in a one of these kind of boots, protective boots yeah. that when you took it off, your calf was non-existent. <laughs> you just thought I've got to, you know, my my whole left leg again was just like a bag of jelly. <laughs> And you think, I've got to spend all this time trying to build up this muscle again. And it was, that was tough to get your head around. But again, you just kind of, you don't have a choice. If you, want to be, if you want to play again, you've got to do it. And if you don't do it properly, then you won't play again. So you have to do it. Absolutely. And I have admiration from anyone who can come back from that. Because three or four years later, my leg is still like jelly, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about when you came back the second time, though, which was coinciding with Chesterfield, this time going on a great cup run which obviously culminated in Wembley. Talk to me about the, the sort of run through there. What, what stage did the club sense something special was going to happen? Because early in the season, most clubs don't really focus on it that much. No, I mean, that, that was the same with us. We, I think until you get to the kind of the, the semi-final, the area semi-final, yeah. you often teams are still picking, you know, giving players a chance who, who don't, don't ordinarily play, giving, giving them some minutes. Yeah. So you get to that semi-final and you think, hang on a minute, we're two legs away from the final. And then uh, I just remember going to, to Oldham. I think we played Oldham at home in the in the first leg and we were battered and we won one nil. And then we went to Oldham on a freezing cold night, one of the highest grounds, probably I think it's the highest ground, in fact, in the, in the country. And it was, it was like a layer of ice on the pitch. And again, we were battered. Yeah. Um, so we were, <laughs> it was just kind of holding on for dear life. And then I think Jack Lester scored at the end and thought, we're going to Wembley. And you know, it's, that, it's just that carrot. And until, it's, until those last two games, it's a strange, very strange kind of paradox in that competition is that, yeah. you know, there's no, it's, it's, it's not viewed with much love right up until the moment where people think, hang on a second, we're close to Wembley here. And then, you know, the whole town gets really excited about it. Absolutely agree. We were there with Luton a couple of years before and it was completely the same. It's 40,000 people at Wembley when three months ago you couldn't get three or 4,000 through the gate for a Tuesday night tie. So, yeah. The manager says, you know, you don't know if this will ever happen again. Yeah. And as it turned out, I I was, I missed that with injury, you know, but, you know, I had other, other chances to play at Wembley later on and I was very glad of that because it was one of the toughest days of my career walking out, uh, seeing, I think it was 50,000 fans played, played Swindon in the final. Yeah. Beautiful sunny day and 
in London and your heart sinks knowing that you're not you're not going to be playing. So uh, I was very glad that I got the chance to another time. I know that you've obviously mentioned the fact that you got to play later on, which you wouldn't have known at the time, of course. But I wanted to ask about, even though you'd had the longer term injuries beforehand, was that one still probably the hardest just because you missed out on the occasion that you probably thought was once in a lifetime then? The thing was, is, you know, when you return, when you've been out for those two injuries kind of changed my career, actually, because yeah. you have imbalances in your body, your leg, no matter what you do, it's still a slight weakness to it. Yeah. And I just get the odd niggle or strain sometimes. And, and what happened in the weeks leading up to that, I played in the, fin- the area final, as I said, yeah. both legs against Oldham. And then I think I've got, I pulled my thigh. The worst part of it was I, I tried to play. Well, I, you know, I kind of said I was okay. I was so determined to, to play, but John Sheridan saw saw right through it, and and he said, "Yeah, you know, you're not you're not involved." So I went down to the spent the whole time with the team down in the hotel. The whole you you make a kind of weekend of it, but it was very tough to take on match day. Yeah. How late up did you still want to? Obviously, I know want to play, but realistically, think. I could give this a go because obviously the manager sometimes has to save you from yourself, but there are some managers that wouldn't bother doing that. I was willing to play on match day. <laughs> and he didn't name the team. So he never named the team on, until match days. So I, I went to Wembley with my boots and I was, I was if, he'd put my, if he'd put my name down in the team sheet, I would have played. And that sounds stupid and foolish and probably selfish, yeah. but I was just desperate to play in the game. And he, he pulled me and said, I know you're not fit, kind of thing. And I didn't argue with him. I just kind of said, you're probably right. But it was tough to take, yeah, very tough to take. Let's move on to happier memories and not far away, we'll be coming back to Wembley again. But let's talk about a spell at Crewe. And then particularly at the end of it, I'm quite interested because obviously after 18 months there, you sort of left mid-season, which was unusual in your career. And you had this sort of very quick turnaround before you ended up at Northampton afterwards. And a lot of players say that sometimes when they're out of those situations, they're not quite ready to make the step to a next club or they'd like to have a little break. But then an offer comes along and they don't know if they can refuse it because what if another one never comes? So was that sort of a situation for you? Because it was obviously a unique one for your career to be in. Yeah, the time at Crew was strange. I mean, a, a first season, I think I played 40-odd games. We were mid-table safety in League One. You know, Chesterfield had been relegated to League Two and I played for a League One team, and it was a. I found it. I found it kind of a difficult club to to move to in, at my age. I think I was twenty seven. Yeah. And the whole team was academy graduates. <laughs> I mean, few of them were over twenty one. Uh, and I think we signed myself, Abdul Osman, a midfielder, and Matthias Pogba, Paul Pogba's yeah. brother, striker. We all agreed. He never really felt like you were fully part of that football club. It was like you were an outsider, even though you were, you'd were been saying So it was a strange dynamic, but there was a lot to admire about the club. They were all, the footballers were technically superb, whether they had kind of the other things, some of them had the thing, other things you need in football, especially in low league football. Yeah. You know, a little bit of grit and fight. This is a club where tackling for a long period was kind of banned in training. And that said a lot about the club. But technically, they were very good and we played good football. So I enjoyed my first year, but the second year, they, was, they started to move, advance a, a, a player from the youth team. And, and they, I didn't feel like they were entirely fair to me in, in terms of making that clear to me. You know, I, I asked and they were, they kind of palmed me off a little bit. And, I, and the opportunities I got after that were very few and far between. So I kind of pushed very hard to leave yeah. at, at, in the January time. No, I'm just when when I did, uh, we came to an agreement on my contract, and I had a, a, I think it was two or three weeks without without a club, so that was very tough. That was very kind of alarming. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't know, you know, it's at that level, it's you, you never know when the end's going to be. Yeah, really. And I was pushing thirty, I didn't have a great injury record, <laughs> as we discussed. So, I eventually got the call from from Alan Nill, who joined Chris Wilder yeah. at Northampton and went into a, a, another relegation battle at the bottom of League Two. Which is probably the start of happy memories because you helped help them survive at the end of the season. Another one that went pretty much down to the wire again, the first of many for the next few years. 
How was that sort of spell going into Northampton? Because obviously we've had a couple of players who have played under Chris Wilder who have sung his praises. But for you, it was probably more about Alan Nil at the time when you were going. Well, he was a kind of connection, yeah. And I think Chris Wilder, you could tell he was a kind of firebrand. <laughs> Instantly, you knew that. He was very canny. Like, in retrospect, to look back at it, yeah. and he sang players like me, uh, Ricky Ravenhill, Leo McSweeney. He, he, he signed a lot of players who were in their 30s yeah. who were trying to, to keep, keep a career. You know, tried to play on and elongate their career, and they were desperate to to fight for another contract afterwards. Yeah. Well, he signed us to the end of the season, and he obviously in tandem with our own kind of desire to to do well and to and to elongate a career that would help the, help Northampton stay up. We were, I think, we were six or seven points adrift at the bottom when I signed. And my first game, we went to to Torquay on a horrible Tuesday night. They were above us, and I think, as I say, I think they were kind of six points above us. And if we'd lost that, we were doomed, really. I think we, I think we beat them two one. So that was a huge result. And they were kind of again, there were huge ups and downs. We had some good runs. We thought we were going to run away clear, and then we had, yeah. had some dips. And it went to the went to the last day of the season. We had Ivan Tony emerge, who's obviously at Peterborough now, probably going to be somewhere else soon. Yeah. He emerged, and he got his really. I think it was his first league start. Like probably in the second last game of the season, and he scored two against Dagenham away. Really arrived, you know, a young guy who'd come through the academy, and that was a masterstroke. So Chris Wilder, there's a lot of canny moves that he made that you look back on now and you think, you know, that was smart. And I've even spoken to him about it, and he admits that yeah, you need, you always want, he always wants players with a point to prove. Even at Sheffield United, he signs okay. players who, even when they were in League One. Some of them were making a step up or they were fighting to get back in the championship or, you know, they, were all, they always had some kind of point to prove yeah. to be released from a Premier League club. So that's, that's, his, that's kind of his tactic. And I think it's the same now. They, they're proving, proving that they deserve to be in the Premier League. That's his, he's always a little bit, you know, he wants kind of underdogs a little bit, I think. You're absolutely right. I mean, every summer you see one of his signings getting absolutely slated and they always turn out to be one of the best players or a key player in the season. I remember the Leon Clark one at Sheffield United when he was getting absolute pelters for it and he was one of the key men in them going up the first time now. So yeah. you're absolutely yeah. spot on. <laughs> Let's talk about um, managers a bit more because it's something that's really interesting. I guess you mentioned it at Crew where you sort of were looking for answers is one of the things players tend to respect most is a manager that just tells them it how it is, whether it's favourable or not the news they want to hear at all. Is that something you've generally had throughout your career? And is it something that is as important as it's deemed to be? Yeah, honestly, everyone, it's a cliche again, but everyone says the thing that they value most, I think, in a manager is honesty. Even if that's like being given a home truth or getting an un uncomfortable Absolutely. kind of home truth, you're better off hearing it. So I've played with managers who have not been like that, who have been scared of confrontation. It sounds strange. You'd think, you know, a lot of managers are, they can shout and ball when they need to in, the, in behind closed doors or on the touchline. But actually, if you're one-on-one -on -one with them in an office, they don't like to say anything that upsets you. So, you know, I, I don't appreciate that. You want, you want honesty. And I mean, most managers I've played for have been like that, but some people you wouldn't imagine, you would, yeah. they, they, they don't like confrontation. So <laughs> uh, they, they kind of fob you off and, and it's that's the what that's what angers you most. In fact, as a footballer, I think if you're if if someone's not completely clear with you, and because although you you're doing whatever you can to help the team, you're also looking out for yourself. Yeah. Well, that means you have to move on somewhere to play football. You need to play regularly. So absolutely, I yeah. appreciate your honesty with that. It's uh, it's really good to hear for us as fans because we all have them frustrations on the terraces. But to know that the players still feel the same and they still have that frustration. It makes us feel a little bit more human as well, I guess. <laughs> Let's talk about your, your big move after that, which led to the Wembley revival for you. I guess two quite different experiences there with Grimsby. So obviously for the first time for you, step into non-league, but obviously a big club at that level. Was there ever a doubt about that and were there still league clubs around at that point looking for you? There was definitely a doubt. Northampton had a, a, we're going through a sticky spell. In fact, that was the, probably the closest Chris Well has ever come to, to getting the sack. Yeah. He's never been sacked as a manager, which is an amazing feat. <laughs> and that's probably the closest. There was a game against Tramia Rovers that we lost and 
and we all thought he was going to get the sack after that. And he was fairly brutal. He said, you're all transfer listed after that game. And he, thought he was just saying in the heat of the moment that soon we were getting, probably about four or five of us got phone calls from other clubs yeah. and he had circulated every single player's name. <laughs> so anyone who, had a, who, who got a bite, he was willing to let go. And I got a bite from, from Paul Hurst, who I played with at Rotherham. Yeah. Chris Boyg was his assistant, who had played with at Forest. Yeah. Again, as you know. <laughs> Um, and then they needed a left back and Chris Wilder was pretty kind of straightforward saying we need you to go because I need you to we need to free up the budget and I didn't really want to but he he made life difficult and uh, we, we shook hands and we're, we're you know fine afterwards it's kind of yeah. the business bit of the ugly side of football sometimes those those uh, those part of part of ways Grimsby I, I did have kind of I wasn't sure about it dropping into non-league and I was studying journalism by that stage yeah. so I was I wasn't kind of averse to the, to the thought of potentially that being the end but I was delighted to assign for them because within a couple of weeks you saw how passionate the supporters were how much it meant to them to try and get back into the football league yeah. really good team spirit Paul Hurst was a good manager and a good guy and someone who I have a lot of respect for so although as you say the first Wembley experience was very tough to take uh, it turned out well in the end. Well, that that's the thing I want to talk about, Grimsby. It would be rude to ignore those two games as the defining moments. So the first playoff final, which obviously a heartbreaking defeat, and then the redemption a year later. There are a lot of teams that crumble after the first playoff final defeat and you see them drop down the table the next year. How, how did you avoid that at Grimsby? Because obviously by then you would have probably been one of the senior players in the dressing room. Yeah, uh, we had a good mix there though. I mean, Paul Hurst, very canny again. He... he... Everyone earned within really very a very small bracket. Yeah. There was no like superstar. The second season, it's been well written now that the fans raised about a hundred thousand pounds to buy Omar Bogle. Yeah, and he scored. Ended up scoring the two goals that that got us promoted at Wembley. <laughs> so the, you know the, it was very tough the first because we I think we were better than Bristol Rovers on the day in the first final, and we obviously went to penalties and we we lost. That's a very bad way to lose after a whole season. <laughs> uh, so it was, yeah, it was sickening for for weeks. But he, he refreshed the team, and I don't know. There was just there was a determination. He kept enough of that team together that there was a determination to to go one better. And when we t- when we when we got to Wembley the second time, we knew we were going to win. It wasn't like we you know we, I hope we win this time. We knew we weren't going to let it happen any other way. So it was that clear cut. Honestly, everyone just sort of on the bus before. We, we knew we were like travelling to Wembley. We'd been through that whole experience before. It's quite kind of overwhelming, you know, it's big for the fans and you see them all lying in the streets and cheering you in and stuff. So that's a kind of a bit of a day out the first time. Yeah. The second time, we just zoned out of that and it was like, we're going to win this game. I find that fascinating because we've had someone on before and again, not about Wembley, but playoff finals. And after losing the first one, the second one, they almost went into it with fear, which I found really bizarre. But to not have that at all in the dressing room must have been an incredible feeling before just saying, we know, we feel we're going to win this one. Absolutely. It was, and the way we, we, we'd had a tough, tough one in the semi-final. We played the uh, Braintree, then managed by the Cowleys. Yeah. <laughs> we did magnificently well to get to that stage, you know, and, we lost the first game at home. Uh, I think it was 1-0. And we, remember we drove into training the next day and there was a banner over the, a bridge saying, Hurst out. <laughs> and we were thinking, you know, Craig, we're halfway through this. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> there you find And the second leg of that was, was a horrible, ugly game on a hot day, bobbly pitch. But we took it to extra time. We scored the winner and there was a huge outpouring, a kind of a relief. It was almost like we got over that on that hurdle that we thought, you know, it was a huge banana skin. Uh, fans poured onto the pitch. I'd never seen Paul Hurst as emotional. <laughs> we kind of we were jumping around in the changing room afterwards, and I, a straight arm punched a kind of huge light bulb, <laughs> smashed glass everywhere on the floor. Everyone was dancing around in bare feet. <laughs> but um, so yeah, it was just once we'd overcome that too, we just thought. This is our year. We knew it. 
And talk to me on a personal level then for the final, because obviously, as you mentioned, your first trip to Wembley, you couldn't play. Your second trip to Wembley was ending in defeat and the third time lucky. How was that personally for you when the final also went that game? I think it was probably the, the, the happiest moment I've experienced on the pitch. I just remember, you know, we went 2-0 up in the first half. And again, at half time, we were just kind of, I don't think anyone sat down. I think we were all just kind of so wired up and <laughs> we are not throwing this away. And then I forget his name, a winger for Forest Green. He smashed in a, an absolute thunderbolt from like 25 yards in the top corner. Yeah. And we were like, oh my God. So we we kind of held on for dear life. And then Nathan Arnold broke away right at the death and scored the third. Mm-hmm. So that was it. And everyone just ran around wild. I just remember tearing off like a kind of daft school kid down the touchline. That was one of the happiest moments. That moment when that third goal went in, and then when the final whistle blew, it was one of the happiest moments I've ever experienced. Really. Brilliant. And then I guess that's where there's sort of a little bit of a confusion for me, because that then turned out to be your final professional game. Well, we returned to Wembley actually the week after. Yeah. Oh, for, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. From the FA Trophy. And I think we celebrated a bit too hard through the week. <laughs> um, it was just a kind of that. Strangely, although it's another Wembley visit, it was an anticlimax. Yeah. If they'd been the other way around, we would have, you know, treated it. It's not that we, it's not that we discarded it or anything. It was yeah. just that the bigger one, obviously, was came promotion. It's worth over a million pounds to the football club. The fans, you know, twenty thousand fans or something turned up for that final, and I think maybe ten did for the trophy. So it was kind of. And it was the other way for Halifax. We played, they'd been relegated. Yeah. And this was a kind of almost like a way to have some sort of redemption in that season for them. And, and they brought a lot of fans. Yeah. I was actually pleased for them. It's strange to say that, but I was pleased <laughs> that they had a, a kind of good end to the season because it's a good football club. So that was my last game, but I kind of I try and gloss over that a wee bit and say that my, my last game was the, the good one. <laughs> I, I would pretend I was being kind to you, but I can't get away with that. <laughs> But then talk to me about the decision to, to move out of the game afterwards. Was it, was it as simple as there not being clubs around? But I'd imagine for you, after just getting promotion, there would have been interest. There was, yeah. Not a lot, but there was interest in, in that league. Even the league below, you kind of part-time, sometimes you can go and earn good money and, yeah. and think about what you're going to do next. I could have signed for Chester, but money wasn't, wasn't quite what I had been earning in fact it was about half of what I'd been earning and it's quite you know I was still living in Nottingham yeah. there's a lot of a lot of issues to weigh up you know it was a one year deal the money was really quite poor and you had to spend a lot to get there and back it's kind of you know there's pretty harsh realities at, at that level Grimsby was a big club at that level Chester was a good club but they, they didn't have much money and there was a couple of other clubs too but I don't know I just at that stage, as I said, I'd, 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 um, I'd qualified, I'd, I'd finished my degree in, in sports journalism and I'd had a few things published in, in kind of national newspapers and websites and whatnot and a few doors began to open and it just kind of felt like that was a natural route that was, that was appearing for me. And so I, I took that chance. I know it was a bit early, I was 32, yeah. but the, between that and the fact that it, my body had taken a bit of a beating, I'd really struggled to string together more than 15 games on a consecutive basis since my injuries. I just felt like that was the right decision to make and I'm, I'm glad I did. And do you feel, was the, moving into the media side and journalism, I know you said it sort of fell into place, was it always or ever a passion of yours or were you thinking earlier in your career about staying in the game and coaching and the traditional routes or TV media, for example? When, when I had my injuries, when, I, when I, that kind of two-year spell where I broke my leg and, and then ruptured my Achilles, I thought, you know, I'm going to need to start thinking what I'm going to do because it kind of really brings home how fragile a career is, you know. So it was just after that that the, the PFA run run a, a course in sports journalism. I looked at other things like physiotherapy, even looked at law. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, you, you 10 years without doing anything in education, this seemed like a good kind of path back towards doing something. It was, a fairly fast track degree, the PFA helped fund it. I thought it'd be a good way to get my brain working again <laughs> in a different way. And it turned out that I enjoyed it and 
I kind of took a lot of satisfaction in crafting a piece of piece of writing, and I was under no illusions how hard it was to to break in. I mean, there's not not many footballers, or, you know, players often go into the into radio and, and television, and often that's because of the profile. I didn't really have the profile, and I knew that it was very competitive. But I, I always say that one of the, the the biggest stroke of luck I had was that Wes Morgan, who was a an old pal of mine at Forest, had the most was part of was a leading figure in one of the biggest fairy tales in yeah, Premier League that, that year. Uh, so he he opened doors for me by agreeing to meet me for lunch and have a and do an interview. And you know, newspapers were would bite bite your hands off for that. So that opened a lot of doors for me, and I was quite fortunate in that way. But once the doors are open, then you've got to get kind of work hard to to push your way through them. And it's obviously worked out for you because. Despite taking a slightly unconventional route, you're still working at the elite level of football, which must be the thing that overall was still the aim. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I wasn't averse to, to leaving football behind. Okay. Um, but I don't know. There is, there is something unique about football. And it's, it feels like whatever you do that's associated with it, it makes it more of a, a passion than a job. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think there's anything I would, I would rather write about or, or speak about. I kind of realise, you realise as well when you leave football behind that, it, that you realise that more. You realise that it's, there's something quite special about it as an industry and as a, everyone's kind of, a lot of people's huge number one passion, you know. Yeah. So to have a job that's associated with that, you, you feel quite fortunate, yeah. And we'll move on to a few quick fire ones now because you've had quite an illustrious career. So we'll finish off with all of the, the best ofs and see what names you can come up with because you've mentioned a few in this interview already that you'll be able to drop. So we'll start okay. with the best player you've played with and against. With, it's probably Andy Reid. I think one of the most naturally gifted footballers yeah. Yeah, that, that I've played with, definitely. And, you know, he, he obviously went on to play for Spurs and Sunderland and, and played in the Premier League. And I think he probably could have played more Premier League football. He'd probably admit that himself. But an absolute wonder of a left foot. And... I kind of drive about him as well. Yeah. And he was dece deceivingly quick. <laughs> um, very skillful. So, yeah. And he also helped me when I first moved into the, into the Forest First team. Someone you know, was playing in front of me. I just gave him the ball. <laughs> and he made my life a lot easier in that regard. So, yeah, there was a couple of guys in the Scotland 21s who, who had good careers. And Sean Maloney was also a very, very gifted, you know, very skillful footballer. But I think... For someone who can decide a game almost, it was probably really. That's fair. And I guess Scotland under-21s might lead to some of your against because there is a cracking list from some of those games. Yeah, I wrote, yeah, I wrote a piece about this in, during the lockdown, actually, just when you, you feel you've got an excuse to, <laughs> to try and find some ideas, you know. Played against a, Sp in a Spain team that included Sergio Ramos, Cesc Fabregas, Jesus Navas, Santi Cazorla, but most importantly, and uh, Andrew Iniesta. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's him. <laughs> he, yeah, not just because of what he went went on to achieve. You know, he was just getting into the Barcelona team at that stage, and we didn't know of him. We were actually more looking forward to playing against Fabregas because yeah. he just made a great through for Arsenal. Yeah. But when we played that game, he he just pulled the strings in the number ten. I was playing in a back three, and I wrote in the piece. He he always felt close but not close enough to kind of get near to, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, Iniesta. I mean, I, I had assumed that would probably be your answer, and it's probably the easiest one for most people to give, so I've no problem with that one. Let's mm. move on to managers. I'm not going to ask the worst or anything. I don't want controversy, but who's the best that you've worked under, or even if not, maybe your favourite, the one that's benefited you the most? Uh, I'll be brutally honest. I don't think I have a very good cast to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't pick a worst, but I think the, it would be between Paul Hart and John Sheridan. I mean, Paul Hart would be up there too, but I enjoyed playing for John Sheridan. He he was scathing. Yeah. So some players couldn't handle that, but again, I as I spoke about before, I value honesty. So yeah. if you could just take it and you didn't mind how kind of acerbic he could be, particularly on a match day, his training was really good. I think he made really good signings and he wanted you to play football. So 
and we enjoy some some success. So a lot of play, you know, I think there's a lot of players who would not pick John Sheridan because they didn't enjoy playing for someone who was quite so harsh at times. But I kind of blocked that out and I enjoy the rest of it. So I think Sheridan probably. Fair enough. And then the final question we always ask, and I think you've probably alluded to it, and it might be one of the last ones of your career, your favourite game that you were involved in as a player. Yeah, I think I think it probably has to be that. I mean, you, play, you know, sometimes you play against a Premier League team. We played against Tottenham Hotspur in the FA Cup once when I was at Forest. Yeah. That was in the last 16 as well. So that was a really, you know, that was, that was a, a game I look back on fondly. My debut, again, is a game you always remember vividly. But the emotion, the kind of emotional uh, outpouring after that game. Playoff game is unique. It's more, it's almost bigger than a cup final because cup finals is a final. Yeah. It's, it's a, there's finality to it. You know, that's the end <laughs> of a journey. A, a playoff game means something huge for next season. Although it turned out that it did for me. <laughs> but that's still part of the emotions. And that, yeah. was, a, that was a huge day. Fantastic. I appreciate uh, a brilliant moment to finish on. And I can't thank you enough for taking your time with us. You obviously mentioned Wes Morgan for yourself. And it's people like you giving us the opportunity. So we do appreciate you joining us. No worries. Pleasure.